One ways to think about adaptive work is it often talks about adaptive work is about looking from the balcony and listening on the floor. So think about your staff meeting or your leadership meeting or your group, the group of the most committed people in your church as the folks who gathered together for a balcony meeting. Uh, just think for a minute that you're like uh, chaperoning a junior high dance and they let you uh, go up above the dance floor and see everything that's going on. It's a really good idea, right? Mm -hmm. and of course, exactly what happens in football. It's why Bear Bryant put a tower at the University of Alabama so that you can get up and see the beginning of the field. It's why the NFL has a camera that's called the All-22. It's a camera that shows all 22 players at one time. And for a long time, they wouldn't let the general public see the feed of the All-22. Today, they'll just take a lot of money from you and they'll let you see it if you want to see it. But they wouldn't let people see it because if you looked at it closely enough, you started realizing that Tom Brady, as great as he is, is missing a whole lot of reads. And the whole point of the All-22 is you can see things you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. You can see patterns and pieces. When you see a quarterback on the sideline, used to be with a piece of paper out of a fax machine, today it's using an iPad. What they're looking at is the feed from the All-22. Because if you get up on the balcony, you can begin to see things that you can't see when you're down in the middle of it. But you can't just stay up on the balcony or you'll become an ivory tower. You also have to go down and listen on the floor. You gotta know what's happening down on the dance floor amidst all the swirl, down on the field amidst all of the energy. That's why a good coach who's up in a box will ask the quarterback, this is what we see, how are you seeing it? And so you have to, so the key act of leadership is beginning to figure out how to look from the balcony and listen on the floor. So when I was in San Clemente, we used to say to our session, our session meeting is our balcony time. It's a time where our elders come together and we try to discern what God wants us to do. We actually literally pray, God, from your vantage point, from your perspective that you have, give us, help us to have eyes to see. And then we would make a decision or we would plan on doing something and then we would then say, now this Sunday, get out on the patio, get into Fellowship Hall, go talk to people and listen to how it's landing. And so you're doing a lot of what I call just going up and down stairs. You're going up to the balcony, down to the floor, up to the balcony, down to the floor. That's why it's exhausting work, right? Because you're having to have the one perspective that is from the balcony and the other from listening on the floor. One of the things you have to discern is, are these literally adaptive challenges? Like, can they be solved? And so one of the things you do is you do some diagnosis work. And so some of the questions you ask are, what are the things we've already applied? What are the things we've already tried? If you find yourself in the same recurring problem, we, we always have a hard time keeping young adults. We've tried many. What have you tried before? Well, we tried, we keep trying to hire someone really cool, right? That'll work, right? <laughs> Uh, my, my colleagues in the Fuller Youth Institute did a study of 200 churches that are actually doing a good job, they're actually succeeding at being able to attract and keep younger people. They wrote a book called Growing Young. It's this amazing <coughs> study, and you can find it on Amazon, and I re highly recommend it. But one of the things they found by getting these people together and looking from the balcony and then listening to young adults is they found that if you're trying to attract young adults to a church, don't focus on being cool, focus on being warm. That what young adults want is community warmth. They want to be known, they want to be trusted, they want to be entrusted with the church. They're not interested in whether you've got flavored coffee and somebody with skinny jeans and a tattoo. And for so many of us, what we do is we go to quick fixes, those are technical solutions, that, and then when they don't work, we don't know what else to do. What have you tried? What learning will be required? Well, one of the things that many people have had to learn trying to reach younger adults is that it's really, really important to listen to the younger adults. You'd be stunned at how many churches start a program to attract young adults and never have talked to a single young adult before they start the program. What losses must we endure? Why is this the most significant challenge to face? Is there enough energy in the room to actually go at it? Is it important enough for us to make changes for it? One of the ways that you can come to know if you've got an adaptive challenge is that adaptive challenges show up in the same way. There's usually a cycle of failure. We've been working at this a long time. We've tried a lot of things, and this hasn't worked. So instead of going to the next quick fix, the next challenge, the next book, bring in the next expert, Hire the next person, right? Almost every church, their, their answer to our decline 
is basically one very clear technical fix. Get a younger model. Just go get a younger pastor. That'll do it. And there's tons of evidence to show that the kind of work that needs to be done to lead a congregation to adaptive change, many pastors who are younger don't have enough maturity, wisdom, or resilience yet to be able to do it. One of my friends who was trying to lead a large inner city church through a lot of change said, I could not do this at 40. I wasn't mature enough, and I didn't understand how, how much I had to be able to disappoint people. My skin needed to be thicker. I needed to be healthier. It doesn't mean they have to necessarily be older. I know lots of older pastors who continue to go to um, quick fixes, but there's usually a cycle of failure. Uh, usually you're facing an adaptive challenge when there's a flight to authority. Very often when I'm doing consulting or our group, we have a consulting group at the school does consulting, the very first thing we have to disappoint them at a rate they can absorb is bringing us here and paying our fee doesn't mean it's going to work. You want us to be the quick fix. We brought the people in from the seminary. They're experts. We are doing what they said to do. No. Our job is to help you adapt for you to grow, for you to fit to learn, for you to face your losses. There's a chorus of complaints. It comes from lots of different places. Very often, a genuine adaptive challenge is not just one group of people. It's a larger issue that you're trying to face, and that's what makes it there's multiple stakeholders. It's a, it's a same old fight over and over and over again, though it may show up in different ways, because it's a deeper issue about the life of the church. My, my wife's a marriage and family therapist. She used to say all the time to her clients that we experienced it in our marriage. We've been married almost 30 years. My wife and I had the same fight for 30 years. It just showed up in one time as about her mother, another time it showed up as sex, another time it showed up as chores, another time it showed up as money, then it goes back to mother, and then sex, and then chores. But it's actually not about any of those things, right? And any of you who've been married know this. There's this deeper issue that if we don't attend to this deeper issue, we're going to keep showing up and have the same old fight over and over and over again, just in a different way. But perhaps the most powerful way that you know you have an adaptive challenge is that today's problem is the result of yesterday's successes. So when your church struggles with reaching your neighbors, I can tell you that the churches that struggle the most are the struggles that were the churches that were the most successful at foreign missions. If I walk into a church and I see a big map and I see picture flags and I see pictures of the missionaries and, I, and then I know that your church is committed to sending money over seawater, I know you'll have a hard time sending people across your parking lot. Hmm. Wow. So we have a tendency to think in terms that, that because we were successful, we were good at missions, so we're not very good at being a missional church in our neighborhood. We were great at sending people to Africa. We just don't have to have any African Americans in our congregation. Come on. We're good at sending people who care about to, to Latin America, but we are not very good at caring for our Latino neighbors and friends. Why? Because we were successful. And so we default to our training. We think it's enough. So I, I literally, I, I'm, I'm working with one of my students who's trying to help his church reach young families. It is a church in, in the middle of middle America, trying to, right in the heartland, they said, we are going to be committed to reaching young families. And they said, so what are we going to do? We're going to do a children's message, and we're going to be more committed to infant baptism than ever before. I said, what are you going to do for the people who aren't going to show up in the first place? Yeah. We're going to put out a flyer telling them that we're committed to having a children's message. <laughs> Why? Because that's what you used to do. You used to be a family-friendly church if you were committed to having children's messages and to letting people know that you're willing to baptize their babies. Those are adaptive challenges because they require you to deal with your deepest values and ask the question, what are we going to preserve? What are we going to change? So before lunch, a couple of principles I want you to think about, and then we'll, we'll work these out after lunch. Principle number one, people don't resist change, they resist loss. People don't resist change, they're resisting loss. So when you're dealing with people who feel like they're stubborn, they don't want to go, they're, they're unwilling to change, they're, then instead go back and ask, what is the loss they're afraid of? What's the thing they're afraid of losing? If you said to a person who's an expert water navigator, hey, we're going to get on a horse, 
right? The experience of having to give up the very canoe they built with their own hands and have to get on a horse. And if you say to them, by the way, there's no horses, so we're going to have to go meet the Shoshone and convince them to give us horses, which means we're going to have to go in as friends, not as conquerors. We're going to have to go meet and work with our neighbors and collaborate with people who we hoped we could just avoid. People don't resist change, they resist loss. Which means for some of us, the single biggest challenge to this is most of us have been told that the way you lead is by always getting to win-win solutions. And on technical solutions, a win-win is a great solution. I'm all in favor of win-win if you can get it. I was trained with the seven habits of the select people, always go for the win-win solution, try not to alienate people. But when you deal with an adaptive challenge, you're dealing with win-loss. You can't both keep going and canoe. You're going to have to choose one or the other. You, you'll have to decide. It may be 1-1-A. One, one it may be 1-2. It may be we'll do this today and that tomorrow. But someone's going to experience loss. So when you decide that we are trying to move our church to be a missionary church, a church that care, that doesn't live, depend upon its privilege and place of the past, but moves into the future, you're going to have to ask yourself the questions, what are we willing to lose? And be really, really clear that you don't lose what is most precious to you. Key adaptive principle number two, for change to last, it must be a healthy adaptation of the DNA of the group. Let me tell you what that means. Organizational DNA are our core values. They're our core ideology. It's what makes us us. And there's not just big aspirational values. They're clear pieces. It's the difference that an organizational value is so clearly different that it's the way we we're able to say, this is who I belong to. This is what I believe. It's, so as Christians, you and I would share some core values. As Baptists versus Presbyterians, we would have some different ones. As a church versus an organization, there'll be some different ones. And each congregation in each place has its set of core values, its clear values that it cares about, the things it cannot change. Those things, the only way to bring change is to do a healthy adaptation of that, of those core values. So when Meriwether Lewis says, we proceeded on, what he had was a healthy adaptation of his core enlightenment values. As a person of the enlightenment, he was eager to learn everything he could while he found an economic solution. The core of discovery was to find a water route, find an economic solution. And your secondary principle is along the way, take a bunch of notes, find some prairie dogs, you know, get captured, find out everything you can. Journal, take notes, figure out what you can along the way. All of a sudden, they get to the top of the Lemai Pass, they realize there's no water route, and their secondary priority, which was their deepest value, became their first priority. Think about how many of our churches were founded or exist or for certain values that now we might be willing to let go. I've been with congregation once where I asked them, what makes your church unique? And they said, our church is one of the only churches in this area that's still committed to sacred music. We have a formal choir, we have a PhD director, we have an endowed choral program. We have a deep commitment to this. We're just dying. We don't can't attract anybody to our church. I'm not against that. I love that kind of music, personally. I, I, I help support our Bach, Center for, uh, Bach Institute for Music. I love that kind of music. But also, you might find yourself in a place saying, what do we do in a world where less and less people are connected to what has been traditional sacred music and more and more people need the gospel. Where are we going to do with our resources? What are we going to do with our funds, our time, our ordering of our services, our priorities? How are we going to hold it? Maybe we're still going to be committed to being a place that, has, that protects the great hymns of the church and does the sacred music, but maybe now as a priority it's going to become two rather than one, or it's going to become diminished rather than then it's been heightened. I remember when I was at Hollywood Presbyterian, we had this giant Cantrans choir, huge organ, 
I mean, the art choir had been on many recordings. It was well regarded. And I remember Fred Bach, who was their longtime choir director, said to me, Todd, never forget that our music ministry is more ministry than music. Our music ministry is more ministry than music. That's why we're not the Philharmonic. It's why we're the church. So if push comes to shove, we do ministry over music. It was our choir director. That might be not be the issue that you face in your church. It might be another one. But for change to last, it has to be a healthy adaptation of the DNA of the group. We're going to be committed to worship, but we have to be committed to a healthy adaptation. We're going to be committed to this value, but we're going to have to figure out what it looks like in this world. Which is why Ronald Heifetz says, for adaptive change is an inherently conservative process. Most of the time, what you're talking about is what we're not going to change, what we're going to hold on to, what we're unwilling to sacrifice. And we get really clear on those things. And there can't be a huge list. It has to be down to the core pieces of who we are. So when we do this, and I'll give you an exercise. We won't do it today, but I'll give you an exercise you can take home and do. When we're trying to help a church discern this, we don't put people in a room and say, so what should never change? What are our core values? Because what they'll do is they'll write a big long list of lots of flowery words that we all believe in, right? We're all just, we're going to put everything up there so that nobody's mad at us. Instead, we ask them actually to do a different exercise. We do an exercise we call tell me a story. We put people in circles. We serve some food. We give them a nice evening. And we go, here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to tell stories about the most important things in the life of our church. We're going to all get together and tell stories about it. Uh, so and about the way in which our, what makes our church really unique and why we love it so. We're going to tell a story about our church, about a hero in the church. Someone that you need to make sure that if you didn't know them, you should know them. Maybe they've gone, gone on to be with Jesus, but you need to know their story. We're going to tell a story about the people who are most important. What's the story you tell the new people? What's the story you pass on to your children? What's a cherished moment that's retold over and over and over again? What's a way of thinking about the future that is so clear, that is so, needs to be so rooted in this great thing about who we were? Talk about the fire. Talk about the way we reached out to our neighbors. Talk about the way in which we were, the, 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 the way in which we uh, all rallied together during the hardest, darkest days. What's one that says, this is what we're really about? Or this is the moment that I was the most proud of us? Our church once did an entire home makeover for an associate pastor whose wife had uh, stage four breast cancer. We gathered the money together outside of the church budget. We sent them to Hawaii for a week. They were overwhelmed with the gift. But when they came back from Hawaii, they got out of the car, they walked into their house, and their house had been completely redone. Because during the time of her chemotherapy, the house had fallen into disrepair. They walked into the door. They couldn't believe they were surrounded by the entire church applauded them, cared for them, hugged them, and loved them. And many people said, this is the kind of church I want to be part of. I want to be part of a church where everybody helps a family who's going through chemotherapy and know they're loved. We tell that story over and over and over again. That's the moment I was most proud of us. Or one that says, that's when I knew I'd done my people. Our church has all kinds of stories we would tell. A story about how after nine, two weeks after 9-11, the oldest group of the church, the oldest members of our church, decided two weeks after 9-11, that they would vote to tear down all the buildings and pay for a remodel two weeks after 9-11 because we had so many young families moving into town and our campus was keeping them from being able to, to move here. Well, we talk about the time when our communion table was destroyed. But after nine years of doing building projects, after doing a, uh, revamping our entire campus so that we could welcome new people, someone broke into our chancel, broke into our sanctuary, in the middle of the night, he destroyed our communion table, he broke our baptismal font, he busted up several chairs, he tore television monitors off the wall in the cry room. He later on, they found him naked with his clothes off. He said he cursed God and passed out on the chancel. And I found him at 7 o'clock in the morning when they called me to tell me that they'd arrested him. There he was in the back of the squad car, his hands in his head, and his head in his hands. I found out that he had just gotten back from Afghanistan. He'd had a psychotic break of some kind. He busted into our sanctuary. He broke it up, and he said, I cursed God and wanted to die. Mm -hmm. 
So we asked a Marine family to come alongside him. And he began to slowly and quietly make restitution. And we dropped all the charges and we welcomed him into our family. And four months later, he took communion in the very spot that he had once cursed God. Those are the kinds of people that I raised my children. So at the end of the time when we left as pastor, they put my, up, us as a family up on the chancel. And both of my children said, we know, I've told this story a hundred times. <laughs> we know Jesus because we met Jesus here with you. <laughs> That's what will never change about us. We put this picture up in the life of our congregation. This picture was found in a, um, in a, in the city hall. It had been up there for years in the city hall. There's a, there was a, a, a covered up piece of paper that had a, that had a um, maxim at the bottom that described the picture as an early marine biology class. When we peeled off the label, we saw that it actually said, first Sunday school held on beach at San Clemente. Someone turned it over and figured out it belonged to our congregation. When we were tearing down all the buildings, we put this picture up about that big in our chancel. Why? We wanted them to know that this was our past. What do you notice about this picture? There's not a building here, right? Why were we doing a building project and we had no building? Because we wanted people to know that our building was not about our buildings. While we were doing a building, not so we could have a building, we wanted a building so we could have Bible studies like this. We wanted children and adults together learning the scriptures. That the scriptures were at the center of whatever we believed. And that we understood that this is who we were. And one of the things that became really important to us in our tradition is that we have a woman teaching the Bible. And so in our tradition, where we had 40 years, we had we believed in women elders and women pastors. We'd never had one. We put this picture up and realized that from the very beginning, we had women who were good at teaching the scriptures. And the next 15 years, we had four different and ordained women pastors. When people start to see that this is your core value and your adaptation for the day, an adaptation of that picture is to build a building, then people start to recognize this is who we are and what we're about. And our healthy our way forward is by telling those stories. Those stories about our heroes, about our cherished moments, about the ways in which I was, I experienced the goodness of God. And then from those, rec those stories, you discover recurring themes. And from those themes, you discover values. So at San Clemente, we started realizing that we wanted to be a multi-generational church that no matter what we would do, that if, even if everybody else around us was going to divide by generations, our picture told us we had to be a multi-generational church. We were going to be a biblically centered church. That it didn't matter where our denomination went with different decrees, our beliefs were going to be focused on the scriptures. And that we were going to be a church that was about our community. That even though many people were doing multi-site, God bless them for doing it, but our church was not going to be one of those. It wouldn't work in our church. Our church would be a community church. And so we would rather plant churches and send people away than get bigger. But there's a certain size that we would have because we would always be about being a beach church in our area that was multi-generational. For change to last, it must be a healthy adaptation of the DNA. And partly the struggle that you'll have to lead people through is getting really clear on those core values. What are the things that should never change? Because, and I'll end with this before lunch, once you determine what will never change, you have to, have to be prepared to change everything else. And that's the struggle. Getting so clear on the values that will never change that you're then willing to change absolutely everything else. You must be willing to learn, and you must be willing to deal with loss. For Meriwether Lewis, when he stood on the edge of the Lemhi Pass and looked over into uncharted territory, at that moment, he was a man of the Enlightenment who had been trained in the White House, who had been tutored by Thomas Jefferson. But when he walked over the Lemhi Pass, he was in uncharted territory, and he lost. There was only one person in the entire core of discovery who was not lost. 
one person who is not in uncharted territory, one person who is actually at home, one person, a Native American teenage nursing mother named Sakakawea. What's powerful about the story of Sakakawea, she was probably 16 or 17 years of age. She was so intelligent and so winsome that even though she was nursing a baby, they took her with them. Every time you think about the core of discovery and those, those you know, rugged outdoorsmen going down, racing down rivers, and climbing mountains, and facing down grizzly bears, remember that Sacagawea did it too, with a baby. And when they stepped over the Lemhi Pass, Sacagawea was the only one that was at home. She'd been kidnapped when, when she was 11 or 12 from her tribe, the Shoshone, taken over the Lemhi Pass and was held by the Hidatsa. She had been won in a card game or sold to the, to the trapper Charbonneau, and now she was there in, back in our home territory. What Meriwether Lewis had learned at that moment was the expert in the uncharted territory is the person who is, who is now at home. And for us, what we're going to have to deal with is the experts in a world without power and privilege and Christendom are all around us. Yeah. They are people who didn't have power and they didn't have privilege in a Christendom world. They are people who are used to leading without power, who are comfortably in uncharted territory and know what it's like to try to have to lead people without having the cultural advantage. At Fuller, we deal with this all the time and we recognize that the global church, the Native American, Native communities, immigrant communities, people of color and women are folks who have been leading without power forever. And now those of us who look like me, who are trained in that Christendom world, are going to have to be able to learn and deal with the humility and loss of listening to people and learning and collaborating with people who are the new experts in the new world. My first day at Fuller Seminary, I was taken on a tour of all the people in my division as a new vice president. One of the men I met was a young guy named Pablo Kim. Pablo Kim. His parents were Korean missionaries to Argentina. He spoke Korean, Spanish, and English. He was here in the United States to be trained for, the mission, for a global mission. The reason why people who look like me are at the top of Fuller Seminary is because 30 years ago, churches like Hollywood Presbyterian gave scholarships to people who look like me. In the future, we need to figure out how to find the Lewises, the Clarks, and the Chicago Weas who look a lot more like Pablo Kim than me. And for those of us who are, who are the people at the head of our organizations, that means we're going to have to learn and we're going to have to deal with the loss. Because once you determine what will never change, the transformational gospel, the values of your organization, the things that make you you, you have to be prepared to change everything else. Let me pray for our lunch, and we'll take a break, and we'll come back and about the long talk. Dear God, thank you for the chance to be with these friends, and thank you for the opportunity we have be able to, to learn together. I pray, oh God, that even over lunch as we have our conversations and even as we can let the things we've learned this morning sit in deeply with us, that you will enable us to understand the challenge of leadership that is before us. Enable us, oh God, to become more and more open to what you want to do in us and through us. Bless this food to our bodies. Thank you for the people who have spent so much time preparing. Thank you for all the BGAB staff who have welcomed us with such great hospitality and professionalism. Thank you for this place, for this museum. We ask you to bless this place, to fill it with the power of the Holy Spirit, so that when people come here to visit this museum, they would find themselves encountering the God who is the one who rules the sea and the waves, who loves us deeply. We ask you to bless them and for the way in which they bless this community with this beautiful place and for their hospitality this morning. And we ask you to watch over us and be with us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. I think we have an announcement. Yeah, yeah, with, uh